Frank the Tank, Jose. Oh, and Jose with the orange Fulgari in your hognose water dish. Yeah, um, make sure there's nothing that they, you know now, but make sure there's nothing that uh, they can touch. Uh, in, nothing they can reach the water dish from is something up against there. Occasionally I'll put the water dish down in my garter snake enclosure and find a armadillidium kluge in there. Same thing. So that's... That happens. I see Wally's here. Excellent. Um, let's see. Yeah, Wally has a stream tonight too. I wish I went. I have an appointment I have to keep tonight. Otherwise, I would totally be there. It'd be fun. Zero Cool, Moon Over Miami, Tip Top Taylor, Noah Wilson, Muffin Man. The oldest isopod colony I have? I guess that would be a toss-up between my Spanish orange, my dwarf whites, and my Nagurus cristalis. Um, and I have had them since... When was that? 2013, maybe? Something like that. The Bug Hub, Holly C, Ian, and Sandy, Linda, Therapod Hunter, welcome. Oh, Happily Ever After, that's Judy. Oh, excellent. Excellent. You are, um, Judy's one of the, the people to whom I sent isopods today, so. Newt's Commander. Yeah, the, the sort of gill lung things that isopods have, they're sort of weird breathing structures. Um, it's kind of funny that they can drown, and they can survive a lot longer than a lot of creatures when immersed, but they eventually don't make it. They get to the point where they don't make it. <laughs> what species has been a pain to keep? Well, there are things about dwarf whites that I don't like. I, mostly, they're easy to keep. They're hard to harvest without harvesting... Um, enclosure substrate along with them uh, things like sheets of cardboard stacked up can help with that but uh, that's probably the species I find of myself becoming most annoyed with if that's what you mean <laughs> and theropod hunter congratulations on your porcelio scaber law that's awesome so this backdrop I think I purchased it on Amazon it's uh, Joshua was asking about that yeah um, I have a couple of them. I have two of these. One for when I'm streaming in one part of the house and one when I'm streaming in another part of the house. Because it's really hard to move them. Uh, do you have any remedies for keeping ice pods out of reptile water dishes? Just basically keeping any kind of, like, cork bark. In my case, it's usually cork bark that causes an issue if I put the water dish too close to it. So make sure the wall is high enough that ice pods can't crawl over the substrate into the water dish and make sure that there is no... Uh, Make sure there's no, nothing kind of bumping up against it. That, that helps a ton for me. Eileen O'Donnell, welcome. And, oh, I'm not sure how to say your name. Vom Rabinage. I finally got duckies. That's awesome. So duckies, they need to be kept uh, with, they can never dry out. Don't let them get dry. There are levels of dryness that are okay for some other isopods and are not okay for rubber duckies. They do like their limestone. And they like uh, fish-based foods. So hopefully that helps. Um, I'm working on uh, calibrating the audio. This is my uh, new mic. So if it sounds a bit quieter, um, the nice thing is that I don't have to attach it to myself. And I'm, I'm just kind of testing it. It's a, it's a shotgun mic. So we will work with that and see what we can get. Maybe I'll just speak a little louder and we'll see how it goes. I <laughs> take off my glass to become isopod, man. That's awesome. Getting the isopods out of the substrate? Mmm. In a bioactive enclosure, it's tough. I mean, you just sift through it like normal, but you can also make sure that uh, if you have the time to do it this way, if you put that substrate in another large bin or something like that, and just put a, like a mossy patch and a hide in one area and moisten only that area, They'll eventually gravitate to that area, and then you can kind of dig them out there. So that will help. Um, hello, Crystal. Welcome. And Noah and Wally, thank you. 
I'm glad uh, the audio is working. Uh, I'm supposed to stay at least two feet away from the mic, which is why I have my glasses on so that I can read what I'm looking at on my, uh, my phone as I'm answering Patreon questions and stuff like that. And Dimitris, hello. Welcome. All the way from Greece. Watching tonight. That's awesome. I mean, it's not tonight for you. Like in the middle, well, it's probably the middle of the night for you, something like that. So, today, I have a lot of comments on uh, Patreon that I'd like to address. And I saw Sandy was in the house here. Uh, a lot of these, well, some of these comments come from, come, come from Sandy, which is great to have you in here and, and asking these questions. I've got uh, items from Mitchell, from Sherry, from Sandy... Um, yeah. Okay. So let's, let's do that. Let's see who's here. When a few more people came in. We've got Backyard Bug Shorts and Leon. Hello. So, Mitchell's question was, if Dairy Cow Porcelia labus and Tropical Orange Porcelia labus are essentially the same species, and why are their behaviors so different? Oranges tend to burrow down while Dairy Cow is a surface dweller. Oranges tend to be shy while Dairy Cows are much less so. Both observations that I would agree with entirely. Dairy cows will gather on underside of wood. Oranges don't. Well, I have seen mine do that to some extent, but uh, they do seem a little less given to it than uh, the dairy cows. And are they really the same species? You can't even crossbreed them. Well, great question. I have experimented with that. I know Wally's experimented with that, and absolutely no dice. We didn't get any uh, crosses from that, so... Uh, yeah, it may very well be that they are different species, that are just, there are some cryptic species going on. There's a paper that I've been meaning to read that challenges basically isopod taxonomy that we, you know, what we think of as isopod taxonomy right now, they, it challenges it quite a bit. So we might find out some interesting things there. Uh, I, I tend to agree with you. They may not be the same species. I know that there has been postulation that the uh, genetic changes that occurred when the morph of dairy cow was produced actually caused some uh, prezygotic barriers by making it too difficult to copulate um, so that mating never occurred properly. I'm not sure where that comes from or what sort of documentation there is behind that if it's just postulation, uh, but who knows. Some other people are thinking that maybe dairy cows actually appear as they do in the wild and they've been collected that way so it'll be interesting to find out more about that so burgundy cabbage how are the night gold coming along well i actually sold off basically all of my b grade ones and i just have the uh, higher grade ones i need to go through that and now sort again so i can get some culls from there and uh, just keep the the really high high yellow ones but some of them are looking pretty nice i gotta say it's been a long time it's been years but it is working and uh, even some of the, the culls, the, the B-grade ones, look pretty nice. So, uh, and I'm sure that genetically they're going to throw some interesting ones too, even the ones that don't look all that fancy. So, Lucky Stone, welcome. Frank the Tank, you have P. Sevilla Caramel in your collection. That's awesome. So, yeah, that's kind of how it's going. So, Mitchell... Great question. I'm going to need to post a video on my experiment with milk back in oranges really soon. I, I might even uh, make that video today if I have time. We'll see. So Sherry uh, had a question about the blue death veining beetles. She said, how are your blue death veining beetles doing? Well, some of you uh, patrons and uh, those of you who follow me on Instagram, or Facebook, or Twitter, I guess, will have seen that I had a new beetle emerge recently, uh, just uh, about a week ago. I, I don't remember the exact day, but I have it documented somewhere, but I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, the pupa I m recently made a video about, he closed really fast too. I think it was two weeks or maybe even a shorter time period than that. And again, I have the documentation somewhere. I just don't remember off the top of my head how long exactly it took. but. I was fascinated to see that, and 
the uh, beetle was able to write itself based on the, the, you know, I had the pieces of cork bark there based on Ethan at Insect Forge suggested that based on his experience with other related beetles. And so it looked good. This is the fun thing, okay? The first beetle that had emerged was in uh, the water when I found it because it managed to climb out of the enclosure inside the incubator and fall into the humidity well in the incubator. And I, I thought it was dead. And if you've seen that video, you know, I have a video that recounts the experience of finding the first one. I thought it was dead, or at least I thought there was a very good chance it could be dead because it had been sitting there in the water for at least a few hours and pulled it out and it was motionless, but hey, it was a blue death painting beetle. So I set it aside, let it dry out. It's tracheal system, you know, cleared out of the water. It started breathing again, started moving around and just acted like a normal beetle, which was great. So the thing was though, it's color when it, when I found it was like a black, essentially like a matte black because it had been in the water. Uh, and these beetles don't develop their blue color immediately, but it was a black color. We didn't know if that was the color the beetles were when they first eclose as adults or if something else was going on. But this second beetle was not black, was not blue, sort of a coppery color. So if you haven't seen it, you can check out my Facebook or my Instagram, my Twitter, or if you're a patron, you can check it out on Patreon because that's the first place I posted it. Um, I, you know, post fancy news like that earlier on Patreon typically than I do anywhere else. So it's kind of a coppery red, which is really cool and kind of fascinating. And apparently that's what color they are when they eat clothes. But a lot of times they don't pupate on the surface. So by the time they come out, I mean, not that very many have pupated in captivity at all, but by the time they come out of the, uh, the ground, out of the substrate as, uh, as adults, they're usually not this red color, I guess. So I, I'm not entirely sure if I'm the first person to ever see the sort of coppery red color or not, but there you go. At least we know that that is what color they are when they first eclose. This one was. This one was kind of small. It was smaller than my first one. I'm still working on, you know, tweaking the best husbandry for the larvae. And this larva was actually really big. But then for some reason it didn't pupate for a while. And I think it lost some water weight, basically. And ended up eclosing kind of small. Which I'm, I'm kind of surprised. Um, Huh, muffin men, that's interesting. So these subway mosquitoes actually speciated in the subway? That is crazy. And thereupon hunters, some of them seem to be more shy like that and don't walk around like the one that just declosed. It eats. I gave it a, a cricket and it ate some of the cricket and stuff, but whenever I go in there, it freezes. And I, I rarely see it move. So we'll see how that how that uh, shakes out. So, Jose, does anyone know if it's possible to have a captive breed culture of giant isopods? Like the, uh, the Bathynomus giganteus species, the really big ones, the deep sea isopods? I don't think anybody's breeding those. There are marine isopods that people have bred. I mean, I've bred marine isopods. Some of the smaller ones, they're, they're super easy to breed if you just get live rock and you have a marine aquarium and you keep the live rock, you know, maintain that. You just go get isopods breeding in there. But I have not... I don't think anybody's done the big Bathynomus species. Ashley, orange and white labus, they aren't, just aren't from dairy cows, a mix of Cali, white, orange, caramel, and milk bags. See that, I think this is fascinating. We've, we've talked a little bit about this, Ashley and I have on uh, Facebook, I think it was, uh, which is quite fascinating that this has happened. And the orange seemed to be from the same stock as the, the, Cali, the Cali mix. And that's the same as the caramel mix and so on. The milk back's probably different stock, but uh, seems to be working for Ashley. She's got a really cool mix of different individuals there. How did the uh, dwarf white thing shake out, Ashley? We were talking about. Is that is that working okay? Are you still working on that? And there's Oshazni. Hello and welcome. And theropod hunters. Um, it's hard to say. They don't. They won't necessarily eat the dead ones of their own species. I have uh, experience with uh, leaving a dead one in there for long enough to test that, and they didn't eat it. 
So interesting. Maybe the other desert darkling beetles would. I don't know. So hopefully, Sherry, that gives you an idea. Um, it was really cool to meet you the other way, Sherry, uh, the other day, Sherry, in person, which is kind of cool. I don't always get to do that with a subscriber or a patron. I mean, I, I have, but it's a cool thing when I do it, and it's kind of rare. So that was cool. Brief though it was, it was fun. Um, <laughs> and Sandy thinks the difference between dairy cows and the oranges is that they're sneaking caffeine. <laughs> so, um, one thing I wanted to do, uh, last week's stream was about magic potions, and I, I mentioned to you that uh, I was able to find the person who discovered and started working with the uh, line of magic potions, but uh, I was also able to contact uh, Kyle of Roach Crossing, who um, worked with Jay. Jay was the, the originator, the collector. He collected and started working with the magic potions. He got some of the stock to um, Kyle, who continued to work with the stock. And so I, I contacted Kyle to ask him about the name and ask him some other things. And this is basically what he said. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here from his email that I have here on my phone. He said, Magic Potion, apparently not the same as the U.S. Magic Potion, are large, long-lived, slow-breeding, slow-growing, high-yellow Dalmatians from Georgia stock. So this was... Uh, and this is an interesting thing. He mentioned that he spent three generations proving out the simple recessive part. In other words, the Dalmatian part of the trait. But he decided to breed them for high yellow as well. So only a few of the highest yellow pairs every generation. Uh, and that is why they have so much yellow in them, which is really cool. Because they've been line bred for that. That's not just a simple recessive trait. Um, so magic potion is not just the Dalmatian trait of the white background with the, the dark spots. It actually refers to the, uh, the this, is, this is, I quote, It is in reference to the milkiness of the yellow mixed with the white, which looked to me like swirling ingredients into a magic potion. So um, he said, true pure magic potions also do not have orange or brown spotting. They are strictly black spotted. The so-called Japanese magic potions, to the extent of my knowledge, are simply Dalmatian vulgari with no aggregate of additional characteristics behind them. And I will not acknowledge them being associated with the U.S. strain, as so many mistakenly have ultimately caused the bastardization of true magic potions. So, pretty cool information, I thought. And uh, thank you, Sandy, for such a great question that uh, got that started. I am... I guess I could say I'm, I'm in your debt for that because uh, that is pretty cool that we get to learn more about this strain. Let's see. So I also have some some more questions, uh, but I'm going to go to the chat and then come back to some more questions. Okay. And I, I'm imagining you can hear people walking right above me. It tends to be that whenever I'm recording, people decide that it's really important to walk right above me. So I'm Apologize for that. Everybody's got to walk, though, right? Okay. So, Muffin Man. Ever heard of clam shrimp? They're very cool little things. Indeed, they are. I've kept quite a few vernal pool organisms and raised them, including clam shrimp. I've raised triops, fairy shrimp, vernal pool, daphnia, seed shrimp, clam shrimp, um, beaver tail shrimp, which are a kind of fairy shrimp, as well as red tail fairy shrimp, and a couple of other species of fairy shrimp. Um, lots of ver ver vernal pool. Why can't I say vernal pool organisms? Those are my deal. Um, and I love them. They're, they're great. I, I've been wanting to do more videos on them. Some, I have some really old videos on my channel of some of those. There are probably some clam shrimp in some of those videos, actually. But they are extremely, uh, old, these videos. They're probably, like, nine years old or something. But they're still on my channel. So, if you want to delve into the ancient and somewhat cringy world of Aquarium X, before I had any inkling what I'm doing, not that I do now, but you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, you can check that out. Okay, so actually still working on the white dwarf. Okay, that makes sense. Josh, still the best place to pick up a new springtail culture. Well, there's lots of places. Uh, Josh's Frogs has them all the time. I'm actually kind of low because I just shipped out a ton of them, but uh, I do have a couple of cultures left. Let's see. So burgundy cabbage, you have Ligia exotica. They're such cool isopods. I remember seeing those in Florida. 
And they'll breed, too, in, in captivity. I remember uh, Oren McMonagall, he, he's bred them in captivity. They work just fine. It's pretty cool. Oh, excuse me. So, Daniel Lopez, what other animals can ice pods cohab with? Springtails, ants, millipedes, lots of uh, reptiles and amphibians. I keep them with my dart frogs, keep them with my crested geckos, keep them with our leopard gecko, keep them with my garter snakes. So, there's that. I'm also working on getting some uh, rove beetles, some small rove beetles, that are going to live with my isopods and eat uh, fungus gnat larvae and eggs, which is pretty fantastic. I'm excited for that. Frank to take. That's an interesting observation. They throw sand over the other beetles. Very interesting. Red. Would you use flake soil as part of an is isopod substrate? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have experimented with flake soil a little bit. I haven't made it in large quantities. I've made it in smaller quantities, and I've mostly used it for beetles when I have made it. But, uh, yeah, I, it's good stuff for isopods, definitely. I would. Okay, and Jose, here, here is myself now. Okay, who are you before? Um, so, handle, my voice volume is a tad... It's low? It's low. Hmm. Let me see if I can just be a little louder and see if that helps. I'm, I'm hoping this microphone is going to work. I can also try taking the, uh, this off. Let me just play with it a little bit. Okay, how's that? Is that any louder? Or is that worse? Let me know. Let me know what you think. Um, if it's worse, then I'll put it back to how it was, but if this is any louder, we'll go with this. So, let's see. Have you ever purchased the same species of morphobisopod from two different sources to mix genes? Eileen, great question, and I have, and I, I've done that on a number of occasions. I'm trying to think of which species uh, I have done that with definitely with uh, high yellow porcelio ornatus. They come from two sources. One of them uh, was Rachel, uh, good, the good bug, the good bug on eBay. Um, and the other one, I can't quite remember right now. But yes, I've done that, and that seems uh, to be a good idea. I'm trying to remember what else I've done that with. I know I've done it with other things too. Uh, magic potions, my Japanese line magic potions from two different sources. And possibly others, but I can definitely think of those. Uh, gem mix. Yep, gem mix. Armadillidium vulgari gem mix. Brook lampreys are available for ponds? That's kind of crazy. Um, so the, the volume is not any better, huh? Okay, well, we're going to play with that, I guess. Um... Okay, well, I'll keep talking and we'll, we'll play with it and see what we get. I tested it out beforehand and it didn't seem too bad, so maybe I'm messing something up. That's the danger of having a new, uh, new microphone and testing it out for just a few minutes. Probably should have been more careful with that. But we'll see how this goes. I'll just try to speak more loudly. So, Echo, I've been keeping koi peacekaber, both orange and normal, long enough to have a cull bin. Notice most of the babies resulting from that bin are dappled with both orange and gray. Ah, that's cool. Okay, so it's a little better now. That's good. Burgundy cabbage knows someone in San Antonio who's on their second or third run with Legia after looking at his setup and he just gave them too much attention. The filter doesn't seem to be good. Interesting. So... Rafe Marshall, can isopods benefit from a bag of earthworm castings I was just given? Um, yes. Earthworm castings are a good substrate for them, a uh, good substrate component for them. Sure. Um, that is definitely something you can benefit from. Okay, I'm going to do a little test. Um, okay. Here, let's do this. How's this? How does this sound? This is my microphone detached. And this is my 
microphone attached right here like this so if you notice the difference between the two let me know whatever it happens to be so okay any good hardy isopods with lots of yellow yellow thing I would say that um, armadillidium gestroy are pretty hardy and they're lots of yellow and they're gorgeous they're big for an armadillidium um, I love them absolutely I had to split my culture recently into two because they were just going crazy they take a long time to grow up they don't breed until they get pretty big but they get big impressively so and they stay bright their whole lives they're like a little like armadillidium granulatum but armadillidium granulatum is kind of like a, a faded version of armadillidium gestroy they're awesome i love them okay okay so it sounds like this sounds working a little better for a lot of you anyway okay and leon uh you're welcome i'm glad that helped i'm glad that helped with your isopods and depending on where you are, it's probably a Ligia species, or Ligia, some people say Ligia, some people say Ligia species of isopod. Probably one of those. Um, I have seen Ligia exotica in Florida, for example, but they live they don't just live in Florida. Uh, super fast. I believe they are an introduced species, but uh, they're sometimes called wharf roaches and things like that because people they remind people of roaches. They're very aware of people very fast. Uh, so that could be what they are, or they could be a related species. There's there's more than one species of Ligia out there. So family pet adventure. Do you have any pandas? I don't. Um, I don't have any pandas. They they're pretty fascinating isopods. I just don't happen to have any of those. And mile high tarantulas, thumbnail Werneri. I've never heard of that. Is that a morph of Werneri? I've heard of, or is that just a typo with like an autocorrect an armadillidium werneri are they hard to breed i've heard they can be a little tricky but um yeah i, I don't know okay so sounds like the uh, sound is a little bit better for most of you with it in so we will go with that and cassie sattler will wild type isopods overrun a mixed colony such as peacecaver lotto mix it depends on the numbers that you're putting together uh, and so on. For example, if you put like three wild types in with a Peace Gaber Lotto mix that has, you know, 150 in there, probably not going to be a problem at all. If you put three Lotto mix with 150 Peace Gaber, it probably will be a problem and you won't see very many um, of those genes show up, at least for a while. It depends on how long you keep the colony and how carefully you look. And that kind of stuff so hopefully that makes sense i would say you will get for at least that first generation when they begin to they actually begin to cross you will get fewer colors the first time around but depending on the uh size of both groups and so on you'll you'll eventually get some more back in there yeah i think muffin man the legia in in Canada there, uh, I think are Ligia palisi or palisi, something like that. And they, they get gigantic, yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Ashley, that blonde duckies uh, probably don't qualify as hardy. I agree. Um, and Leon... They're tough to keep, according to Oren McMonagall. They, he talks about them in his book. Tough to keep because they need really cool temperatures. Um, so th there's not just that. That's one of the things he mentioned, is they need really cool temperatures. So that's, that's kind of tricky. I, I, I don't know that it's going to be really uh, practical to, to keep those in captivity. Therapon Hunter. Oh, so you've had Werner and you find him slightly easier than Clue Guy. That's interesting. That orange morph is great. Okay. So, uh, okay. Thank you, Ashley. That's good to know. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get some, some ideas about this, Mike. I'll, I'll take it back if it's not going to work. But the fact that I can be free from uh, the, you know, I'm not attached is nice. Of course, it has to be directional. But 
it, it would help me in a lot of ways if I can get it to work. If this one doesn't work, I'll try another one, I guess. I can get my money back for this one. Um, Edson, Edison, sorry. Do you have an idea when you have Peacekeeper Lava for sale? I have a ton of tiny ones, but they need to put on some size before I can really sell them. So it'll probably be a few months. I would say probably no sooner than three months, maybe longer. Uh, there are, like I said, loads of babies in there, but they're all tiny because I just, you know, started keeping them. So, and I usually want to make sure my colony is really robust before I start selling them. So, um, it, did, it wouldn't hurt to check within three months and see what they're looking like. Probably no sooner. And that one plant guy, I'm happy you could make it to the stream too. Yeah, we're, we're getting a lot of people in the, uh, the streams lately compared to what we used to get, which is great, even if it's just me standing here talking to you. I mean, I like all the different formats we do. I love it when we do interviews with people. It's really interesting. I like uh, when I get to show you a lot of creatures. That's really fun as well. But I also like this because I feel uh, you know, more focus on what we're talking about. It's, it's kind of fun too. So I'm glad that people are, are appreciating it. So... Takta Narada, having trouble getting your gestoid to breed. They do take a long time. Mine probably took about that long to breed, seriously. I got them when they were tiny. I didn't have any adults. All of mine were probably like two to three millimeters long, if that. They were minuscule when I got mine. And it was probably a good year before they were breeding. Uh, so it might be that. It might be that. And Logan, super new to the isopod hobby, really want to start keeping some soon. Do you have any suggestions about the amount of ambient lighting isopods require? Very little. Very little indeed. I bred isopods in a cabinet for a long time, for probably a couple of years, or close to a year and a half, something like that, with um, the only ambient lighting they got was what leaked through into the cabinet and whenever I opened it. And they were fine, and they, they would breed there. They really aren't very picky regarding light because they tend to avoid it anyway. So uh, you don't need to worry about that too much. Oh, it looks like we got a got a sticker. Thank you, Cassie. That is awesome. I don't think I've gotten a sticker in a long time, so I really appreciate that. Thank you. That is great. Let's see. And Leon, I would love to ship to you, but I can't ship out of the country at all. So, yeah, that is an awesome donation. I really appreciate that, Cassie. That is great. And Moomba has been a while. Nice to have you here as well. What are we looking at time-wise? Okay, I got a little more time. I'm a little pressed for time this time. I might have to end at about 6.15 today. But... Um, I'm, I'm happy to stay as long as I can. I would stay happily longer if I didn't have an appointment that I have to be at. So, all right. I'm trying to think of what else is going on. Thank you again to everybody who has purchased stuff, uh, purchased isopods and things like that, purchased isopod kits. I'm excited about it. It's working well. Um, it's really helping, uh, the whole channel and everything. So I really appreciate that. I wanted to, to mention that. I'm going to answer a question for, uh, Sandy in just a second here, but I've got a couple of questions. Yellow Fang. Oh, thank you. And how are the Ornatus High Yellows doing? Doing great. I've got quite a few uh, from the original. I have some original adults, but I also have a lot of young from them that are nearly mature and uh, babies in several different ages. So any new favorite you're working with? Well, I really like... Uh, Porcelio Flavo Marginatus from the thumbnail here. That's that's a fun one, and that's it's kind of one that I haven't had for very long. Got that from Smugbug. Uh, I'm really loving the Oreo Crumbles. Porcelio Ornatus Prunosus Oreo Crumbles. It's a lot of fun. And the Porcelio Ornatus um, Nord is super fun. And they're all breeding. All the ones I just mentioned are breeding. So that's, that's fun. So those are some of my favorites. And real deal, peat moss, I would say, is a good... Mm, ingredient, but I wouldn't use it as the sole substrate preferentially. I mean, you can make it work, but uh, you can't. 
I mean, it's not it's not ideal. It's a little acidic as a plain substrate, not terribly nutritious as a, just the basic substrate. So I would say, if you put leaf litter over it, you could probably make it work, but it's not the best. So, good question though. And Leon, no problem. Um, I appreciate the uh, desire to send one, and I know that not all countries can send them. So Danny, uh, if you want to buy isopods from me, you can go to isopodsrus.com. Um, that is uh, my site. I am redoing the site a little bit at a time. You're not seeing the changes that I'm doing so much, uh, but I'm building the site and then I'm going to migrate it all over. And so it's going to be a lot cooler with shopping carts and everything. Right now, you just look at what you want to buy. You send me a, an email and I send you a, a, a payment link and it works that way. Um, I might not be shipping. Well, I'll probably be shipping next week. I might have to... Uh, shut it down for a little while but because uh, I wasn't able to get done what I wanted to get done earlier I got some of it done but anyway you can you can definitely check out isopodsrs.com so and thank you Cassie and Crystal appreciate it so mile high tarantulas I would probably keep some tarantulas except my wife has asked me not to so if I ever get a an off-site facility away from home then I'm I'm good to go I can do that uh, but since all my critters essentially uh, live here um, and she very graciously we, we had a discussion and some of you have heard this but she said no tarantulas no roaches and nothing with medically significant venom in any category and I said Ooh, that makes sense I, I can I can deal with that I can live with that because then everything else is on the table so that was our agreement and uh, I go with it but if I do get a, an off-site facility sometime that's not home then, yeah, I'd, I'd pick up a couple tarantulas. I've been offered some and would be interested in doing it. I just can't right now because I want my wife to be happy. And I want her to be happy with me. And that's why. So, Heaven Angela, hello, welcome. And Theropod Hunter, oh, Dairy Cow's a good suggestion. And thank you. This one came from Isopod Source. Love this shirt. The rubber ducky shirt. I don't know how much you can see of it, but there's my rubber ducky shirt. I like to wear isopod shirts. I probably have like eight or ten of them. I don't know. Something like that. And... Oh, so sad Florence. My least favorite species of isopod is dwarf whites because they get into other cultures. They're tricky to harvest without harvesting substrate with them. And since I'm not supposed to ship them with substrate, I have to pick them out very meticulously by hand. I do use uh, sheets of cardboard and that helps, but they're still annoying to catch and they get in everything if you're not careful. So I'm really careful. I don't have any dwarf whites in any of my cultures right now, but when I first started out in the hobby, I had them in there and I enacted some pretty strict protocols for cross-contamination, avoiding cross-contamination. That helped a ton, but uh, yeah, that is the species that I, is not my favorite. Even though they're really useful and people want to buy them and all those great things and eh, they're not my favorite oh that one plant guy wow ship out some powder orange to trade for panda kings pretty good deal and thank you jose I, i'm always glad to have you here so um logan it depends on the species of ice pod you're getting and stuff like that uh and also what you do with them you can limit their reproduction somewhat based on how much leaf litter they get and how much supplementary food they get things like that um, and some species you know dairy cows are going to populate really fast um, porcelionides prunosis are going to populate really fast some of the armadillidium are slower breeders so those might be a better uh, better option for you and thank you, Supreme Gecko, Wally, for posting the, the website up there. Um, Frank Detank, how are the snakes doing? They're doing great. They're eating like pigs. Uh, they got their appetite back after... They were eating within about a week, but the... And Ruby, the female, her appetite was just back on within a week. And the males, uh, maybe even shorter than me, maybe it was five days for her or something like that. Um... The males took a little longer before they would eat uh, pinkies. They would eat 
worms but not pinkies at first and then they would eat worm scented pinkies and now they're just eating pinkies they don't have to be worm scented uh, so yeah they're doing they're doing absolutely uh fantastic and i'm pretty sure that ruby is pregnant and it's gonna garters pretty soon in a couple months here i'm really excited for that i have never bred snakes before this is gonna be a first for me bred other reptiles but not snakes so i'm pretty excited about it so Vince's Outdoor Adventures. I currently cannot ship any ice pods to Florida. That is true. I'm waiting until I had to send them samples of the species that I'm selling. And Florida anyway has restrictions on which ones you can ship there at all. Uh, heavier than the normal U.S. restrictions. But uh, yeah, I can't ship anything to Florida until I get a response on that. I've been waiting for months on that uh, after I sent those samples in. So, so Logan, uh, yeah, dairy cows, if you have, if you're worried about them reproducing really fast, well, they're, they're going to do that. So that might not be the best species for you. Uh, Porcelia scaber reproduces somewhat more slowly, but really an armadillidium, one of the less prolific armadillidium might be a better option for you. And... Okay, and I do have a Facebook, Aquarium X Pets Facebook. You can check it out. And thank you, Crystal. What do you feed isopods exactly? Just wondering. Milton. Well, you can feed them a lot of different things. Leaf litter is one of their main foods and uh, decaying wood. But I give mine a lot of fish food as well. I give them bits of vegetables of various types and bits of fruit of various types. Just about anything of that sort uh, will be good. You do want to avoid contamination with pesticides, so washing and peeling is important. But they really love things like squash and pumpkin, like zucchini, the, uh, green beans. I give them green beans. I give them frozen peas, um, all kinds of things like that. And there are plenty of other foods, like the supreme isopod chow you can get. You can get uh, isopods. Viv Vivariums in the Mist makes a lot of isopods foods, too. And uh, so does rapashi. There's a lot of different foods out there you can feed them. But since they're detritivores, they're not picky. Um, so that one plant guy, how often do you have to water or feed a single culture? It totally depends on the amount of ventilation. It depends on the size of the culture. Like new cultures, you barely need to feed at all for a while. You could probably get by with not feeding, with feeding a new culture maybe once a month, very sparingly. But once they get going, you know, I usually feed most of my established cultures about three times a week, maybe more, and, and also top them off with leaf litter once a week. So, yeah. Algae wafers to isopods? I think I have done that. I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, that makes sense that they would like them. And, oh, all the best from Serbia. Excellent. I'm not sure how to say your name because you have some marks on the name and I don't want to slaughter your pronunciation of your name, but who named Montenegro and Dubrovnik morphs? I'm not sure. Good question. Oh, wow, we're up to 75 people. That's awesome. Um, so Snake Boy, you're wondering if the tiny millipedes would be a good cleanup crew for a green iguana. I haven't worked with isopods as a cleanup crew, partly because they most of them produce some kind of nasty uh, chemical defense, and that uh, might be a problem. I don't know that a, an adult green iguana would bother them so much, these tiny millipedes, but uh, that's why I haven't, so I'm not sure I could tell you why. So Sherry, I, I do have some Hoffman's egg guy. Um, I have two two morphs actually, or two morphs, two localities, I should say. I have the the nominate morph, the you know the normal one, and I have the uh, black Hoffman's egg guy. Unfortunately, I can't ship them. I don't have a permit to ship them yet. Hmm. Ah. MCG Tom. Yeah, they do love the bee pollen. I've been given the, the bee pollen and they seem to love it. Uh, okay, well, E-Dog. On Oniscus acellus, um, you could use them as a cleanup crew. They're not, they're not great feeders because they're spiky. At least it depends on what you're feeding them to. But like red-eyed tree frogs, for example, tend to spit them out because they're kind of spiky. They're, their skirts are a little spiky. So that might be a problem. I would say 
it is a good idea to breed them uh, separately from other things for a generation or two before you uh, before you use them as a cleanup crew, like a couple generations. So I'm going to answer Sandy's question about morning geckos to make sure I have time to do that. Uh, and then uh, we'll try to get to a few more questions in the chat. So Sandy says, I have five Hawaiian morning geckos. Their children are six months old and younger. They're living in separate quarters, mom and kids. When and how can I introduce them to live together in peace and harmony, if ever? The moms are aggressive. Once I missed getting out a couple eggs, they hatched and mom chased them. One dropped its tail. Thanks so much. That is uh, a good point that the females will, the, the adults, most of them, you know, almost all of them are females. The adults will uh, chase the, the babies. I've seen a couple of times, I've seen them actually catch and crunch down on not just their tails, their whole body. I wasn't able to catch it in time. Generally, I'm able to get the babies out. Uh, before the adults get to them, but that has happened. They will do that, if, especially if they're a little hungrier than normal. Uh, I would say I have successfully introduced uh, younger ones in t with the adults, but I wait until they're at least four months or so old, probably closer to five or six most of the time, but I think I've done it as, as young as four months so that they're just bigger. And then it's always a good idea to make sure that there is, first, an abundance of hiding places, and second, that when you introduce the right before you introduce the younger ones change the decor switch it up a little bit make sure that you're adding new hiding places moving some of the older hiding places and that can you know throw off the established adults enough so that they're not going to be quite as adamant about uh, fighting the other ones that seems to help so that's generally what i do i'll throw in some extra hiding places and then put them in and they seem to be okay there's, there's always a little squabbling, but there's always a little squabbling anyway, and it doesn't seem to result in a whole lot. They'll lose, you know, tail tips and stuff once in a while, and that's just kind of inevitable with a colony of, of morning geckos in my pot. In my experience, it does depend on your uh, clone that you have, because some of them are just more aggressive than others, but uh, that has been my experience, so I think you can do it successfully. So, Jared, um, most roly-polies uh, are that people are familiar with are armadillidium species. They breed more slowly than the sow bugs typically and less frequently. So that's probably all it is. But there's one thing I would mention, and that is take a look at your ventilation. Um, armadillidium generally require more ventilation than uh, the sow bugs do. So if that is something um, that, if, if you don't have enough ventilation in there, that might be uh, interfering as well. So those are my those are my tips there. So Brandon heard back from the ice spot phasmid permit. And they all they asked and they asked all sorts of weird stuff for an unrequited contract like floor plan. Huh, interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm actually getting. I just got a a response for a permit I was requesting, and I have to look into some weird stuff like that too. It's just basically if they're something that they don't consider a threat, they're not going to ask you for that. But if there's something that they consider a potential uh, risk they want to make sure that it's contained very well they'll ask that kind of stuff so that's probably why because you're working on phasmids and or exotic ice pods from out of the country that aren't established here already um, so tip top Taylor uh, I would say that my understanding is that there is a difference between orange vigor and um, a vulgari tangerines and it has to do with the uh, color at different ages I can't remember the exact difference but I think that the tangerines mature out at orange and they're when they're younger they're a, a paler color or something like that I don't want to say exactly because I could be wrong but it's something like that and Alice and yes your shipment is on the way um, and I really appreciate the fact that you are enjoying the channel. I love to hear that. It helps me feel good about what I'm doing, so I appreciate it. And J-Man, welcome. Great to see you here as always. And Crystal, yes, you should try the bee pollen. So E-Dog, haven't had any monkai in your dairy cows. Hmm. So there's, there's plenty of leaf litter and everything. Um, I would be interested just seeing your setup. Like, uh, 
you know, one minute video clip of your setup and just walk me through it. That would be interesting. How long did it take for your Japanese magic potions to breed? October is when I got them, I'm pretty sure. I think it was, I want to say early October. And I just noticed a um, tiny, tiny little monkey in there just a little while ago. So what is that? Like five or six months, something like that. So millipedes and isopods in the same enclosure. I don't do it. Some people do. The reason why I don't is because when a millipede molts, sometimes it gets little cracks in its exoskeleton. And if left to its own devices, those will often heal in subsequent molts. If an isopod colony, a robust isopod colony, is existing in that culture along with that millipede, and those cracks exist, it's very likely the millipedes will go after that. I'm, the isopods will go after the millipede. Plenty of people do it successfully. Can't say that uh, it never works, but that's why I don't do it. Okay, so Jared, that's good that you have lots of ventilation then. Um, it, it may just be kind of the age thing and the, the slow reproduction. Armadillidium vulgari, at least, and there are different species that breed the different ways, but that species tends to reproduce fairly infrequently and produce a large number of monkey. Okay, you dog. Yep, that sounds good. So, Braden, any tips for moving with pods, frogs, and geckos? Leaving the city headed to a rural Montana, so about a 12-hour drive. Okay, well, depending on the temperature when you're doing it, so uh, time of year and whatnot, it's going to be really important to make sure that temperature regulation is going to be a huge factor. Um, you may want to consider... Um, if the temperatures are going to be, you know, you're going to be in a car or a vehicle, and if it's, if you're going to experience temperature fluctuations, I would use coolers, like the, the big coolers you can get for, for food, and put them in there, and not necessarily, I mean, you know, don't put ice in there, obviously, but um, use coolers to help mitigate temperature changes. Also, make sure that uh, if you're, if it, with a 12-hour drive, you're going to make sure that there's going to be shade protection for them and, and climate control in in the car, obviously. If, if, if you wouldn't be comfortable in the car, then don't leave anything in the car like that uh, for long enough to cause a problem, park in the shade, that sort of thing. And, you know, this is kind of obvious, but um, moving them with coolers is something I have done um, when I am traveling with, with creatures like that. And it, it seems to help a lot, even, even in hot summer days. If I'm traveling with a cooler and I basically think, if I'm uncomfortable in the car, the cooler shouldn't be in the car either. Uh, that has served me well. And Revelicious, yeah. You give the ice pods some of that po pollen. They, they seem to like it. And Avery, I think you're right. I think eventually one species will outcompete the other. It might be a long time, but I think it's going to happen. And Bren Stack, ice pods and tarantula scorpion setup. I would say it depends. Since I don't have any tarantulas, I can't really advise you there. I do have some dwarf isopods in with my scorpion, and it doesn't seem to be a problem. Okay, Jared's got orange tangerine officinalis and parake. Oh, though some of those are the parake, those are really fancy breeders. And I mean they're prolific. Eileen. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for joining us. I, it's always a pleasure to have you in the stream. And I'll see you next time. Oh, and Supreme Gecko, that's a good idea, because a lot of the pet stores will get things shipped in styrofoam coolers, and so you can just ask them, can I have the ones that your fish were shipped in and whatever, and reuse those. That's a good suggestion, Molly. Thank you. Cool. I am double-checking to make sure I didn't miss anything in, the, uh, in Patreon. I think we got everything, all the questions. Someone just asked about Flavo Marginatus, though, and I think I missed it. Um, are Flavo Marginatus used? <laughs> I mean, worth it. I think so. <coughs> Excuse me. They're not a big isopod, but they are unique. The contrast of their pattern is fantastic. Uh, hard to beat, really. Um, and they are, they, they stand up on their legs higher than a lot of isopods. And they move fast, and they're just, 
they're just kind of a different thing, like on a different wavelength than other isopods, I guess. Sort of. Uh, so I, I think they're worth it. If you want something unique, then go for it. And arthropod ambassadors, great tip. Um, at this this time of year, still a little cool. That 72-hour pl plus heat pack will really help keep things um, mitigated in the as temperature department when you're when you're traveling. So good idea. Excellent suggestion. All right, everyone. I've got to go. So thank you so much for the stream. Thank you, Cassie, for the, the sticker. And uh, I'll see you all on Friday with a new video. Take care, everyone.